Okay, so. Good. Wait a minute for the live stream to set up. Okay. okay. I think it's now working. Okay, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Nathaniel Beristiki for his second lecture of this three lecture series. Um, so I should remind you that uh, these lectures are being live streamed in YouTube and also being recorded and uploaded in, in cloud. Okay, so without further ado, let's... Uh, uh, so Nathaniel, up to you. Okay, so hi and uh, welcome back. Um, so today, uh, so let me just recap Ye yesterday what we did. We talked about uh, Gaussian multiplicative chaos. And today I'm going to start talking about uh, something that on the surface looks very different, uh, which is uh, this uh, notion of thick points of uh, random walk. Uh, but I will mention, I will explain how uh, this is connected to uh, multiplicative uh, chaos. And uh, here maybe you notice that uh, I wrote multiplicative chaos, but I didn't write Gaussian multiplicative chaos because we're going to be talking about something that's highly non-Gaussian. And uh, so just to, to set it up, I imagine that uh, we have some domain uh, D uh, in R2 that's, uh, let's say, open and bounded. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider uh, a graph, basically Z2, but with a fine mesh size uh, within, uh, within this. So, uh, so this is a mesh size of size one of rent. So dn is gonna be uh, d intersected with uh, one over n times Z uh, squared. Okay, so this is the graph that you get from uh, 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 considering, uh, so it's, it's a lattice approximation of D, if you like. And uh, I'm going to be considering a simple random walk. Uh, so I'm going to call that XT. Uh, uh, right, so it starts somewhere uh, on the graph, maybe, uh, maybe here. And, uh, you know, it walks and walks and walks until it leaves the domain. That's the time that I call tau n. And it doesn't really matter in what way I set it up. Let's say that it's in continuous time. Um, to be honest, I can't remember whether it's in continuous time at rate one or in continuous time at rate four, uh, when I do it like that. Uh, these things don't change much, but they change constants. Uh, and I can't remember what's my uh, uh, convention here. So, uh, so this is in continuous time. And I, I think rate one. So after an exponential with mean one, it uh, moves uh, away from its current position. And uh, the object that's going to be uh, of interest is the, the local time uh, of this uh, random walk. So LXN, uh, this is simply the total amount of time that the walk would spend at the position X. So it's the integral from zero to time tau N. Uh, indicator that uh, xt is equal to x times uh, dt. Okay, so the very basic object, how much time did the walk spend at a given place? And uh, maybe let me ask uh, two questions. One is what is the typical value for a point? And uh, the other one is what is going to be the maximal value? Right, so uh, the typical value, well, it kind of depends a bit what you mean by typical value. Uh, if I really pick an X at random, well, typically it won't be visited by the walk. So typically uh, it, it's, 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 it's zero because the probability to be visited by the walk is, uh, it tends to zero. Um, right, so the, typically the, 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 the fraction of sites visited by the walk would be something like one over log n. Uh, so the, the probability that a typical site is visited would be something like one over log n. But okay, this is not a very interesting answer. So maybe uh, if visited, so for instance, the origin, the, the origin uh, of the walk is visited because we start there. And if visited, what is the uh, typical number of visits or typical amount of time that uh, you will spend there? So 
um, it's not hard to see that uh, this is approximately some constant times uh, log n. Uh, why is that? Uh, well, there are many ways to, to see this, I guess, but um, you know, we talked about the green function yesterday. The green function, we, we said, blows up logarithmically. So, uh, and the green function measures the amount of time spent somewhere. So uh, this really shouldn't come too much of a, uh, too much of a surprise that it looks like log n. Um, yes, uh, so there, there are many ways to see this, uh, that this is the right uh, order of magnitude. Um, it's more interesting. So, the, so this, you know, these are easy to answer, uh, these sort of questions. Um, the questions about the maximum value are uh, much more complicated, much more delicate. So uh, what's not hard to see is that uh, if you do visit a point, uh, then the total number of visits uh, to this point will be geometric. Okay, it's a geometric random variable. The total number of times uh, you will come to this place uh, will be a geometric random variable because each time you come to it, there's a fixed probability that you will never return. And so the total number of visits has to be geometric and the, the probability of success looks roughly like one over log n. Um, that, that, that's why the expected number of visits is roughly log n. And um, because of that, and using a sort of a, a first moment argument and a union bound, it's not hard to see that uh, the maximal value will not be much more than uh, log n squared. So up to a constant. So, um, just you know, summing over all points, uh, there's roughly n squared of them, and you ask uh, yourself, are you going to make much more than log n squared visits? Uh, you you see that you don't if you if you pick your constants correctly. So an argument like this uh, was um, uh, it's a it's a simple argument, but uh, so th this led uh, uh, Erdős and uh, Taylor. Um, to make the following, uh, to prove the following results, that uh, if, if you look at the maximum uh, over the n of the local time and you divide by log n squared, so they were able to prove that uh, this is less than four over pi to leading order. And uh, so this is essentially the, the, the argument I just, uh, I just explained, uh, just done with a constant correctly. Um, and what is maybe uh, much more interesting is that they were obtain, able to obtain a matching lower bound. Uh, well, matching, but with a different constant. So, uh, uh, so this, was, uh, this was what they proved. So this was in 1960, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so this is, of course, you know, with probability uh, one as n tends to infinity. So. Well, the probability of that tends to one as n tends to infinity. Uh, and uh, so, so this is the result that they proved and they, they conjectured uh, that uh, the upper bound is, is sharp. Okay, so what you get from the first moment gives you the, uh, the right uh, answer. So they conjectured that the maximum divided by log n squared really converges to four over pi. In fact, uh, their conjecture came with a much more precise uh, description of points which are vis visited uh, very often by the walk. Uh, so let me make this definition. Uh, so uh, because this is something that's going to come uh, throughout this talk uh, today. So T n of A, so this is the set of thick points. So these are the thick points of the walk. So these are the set of points uh, in your domain uh, where uh, the local time is greater than, uh, let me write it like that. So this is uh, two over pi times a times uh, log n squared. Um, so a is gonna be a parameter. Okay, maybe I should, it will uh, end up being uh, between zero and two. Uh, A equals two corresponds to the, the, the maximum. Okay, so uh, two over pi, pi times A becomes four over pi. Uh, and uh, 
so yeah so so this is the, the notion of thick points so these are the points uh, which are visited a fraction of what we believe is the maximum and when a equals two we are talking about things that are basically close to the maximum local time okay so so these are the thick points of the walk and a is the thickness parameter so how how much how close to the maximum we're talking about so uh, they conjectured so uh, Erdos and Taylor conjectured, in fact, uh, very precise behavior for uh, the, the order of, my, well, for the size of this uh, set of thick points. That um, the, the number of thick points uh, looks roughly like n to the power of 2 minus a plus little of 1. So, you know, phrased in a sort of continuum language, uh, right, the, the dimension of uh, Tn of A is, uh, is A. Is that, I'm sorry, it's two minus A, sorry. So, um, okay, so, so this exponent here is, is related to the Hausdorff dimension uh, of this set, uh, of the limit of this set in the continuum, if you want. And uh, maybe uh, what I can do uh, right away is to show you a bit of a picture of what this looks like. So this suggests there is a, a, a multifractal picture that, uh, uh, that is there and that is uh, describing, uh, maybe I should do it, maybe let me do it here. Okay, so this is, uh, a large random walk. And what you see here is kind of a heat map. Uh, so heat map, so, so the, the points, uh, so heat map of local time. So the, the darker a point is uh, means uh, the more visited it has been by the walk. I don't actually remember, I don't know in fact where, where the uh, where the walk started, nor where it ended. But you can see that uh, if you've never looked at pictures like that, this, this really suggests that there is a multifractal picture going on here. Um, you know, we, we, are, we, we look at this and we see a sort of kind of fractal looking set. And uh, the, the, the fractal exponent associated to this set is captured by this expo exponent here, which they, they conjectured. So let me say that uh, Erdos and Taylor, uh, their theorem uh, relies on uh, uh, a first moment argument uh, for uh, for the upper bound. So I've mentioned that. And uh, for the lower bound, what you usually try to do is you try to uh, you know prove a lower bound. Uh, on, so you try to, to get, sorry, excuse me, an, an upper bound on the second moment uh, of the, the set of thick points, for instance. Uh, for lower bound. And uh, maybe unsurprisingly uh, for us, uh, this is uh, very similar to the story I discussed uh, yesterday. This uh, second moment, uh, in fact, blows up when the parameter A, the thickness parameter A, uh, when A becomes too large, and here this corresponds to a greater than one. Okay, so if you go back to their argument, uh, you know, they, they, the, 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 the upper bound comes from the first moment. There's no problem in computing the first moment. The second of the number of thick points with parameter a. Uh, so that, if you want, gives you an upper bound on the a rigorous upper bound on the, the size of the set uh, of thick points. Uh, and if you want a matching lower bound, then you have to compute a second moment for uh, for this set, for the size of this set. And uh, you only get something uh, that match, matches the square of the first moment if A is not too big, meaning A is less than one. And that corresponds to, their, to the lower bound. That explains why they were able to uh, prove this result only 
uh, with, with two constants that, that don't match here and here. Uh, is, that, is that clear so far? Please uh, interrupt if there are questions. Um, okay, so um, I, I, I mentioned this because this is very uh, similar to the, the issue we were facing uh, yesterday, uh, where we, 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 I explained that for the proof of convergence in Gaussian multiplicative chaos, there is a regime in which you can do L2 calculations and the region beyond that, the L2 calculations breaks down and you need to uh, uh, come up with uh, more sophisticated ideas. So uh, there was, uh, in these stories, there was a major uh, uh, breakthrough. So this was uh, really a landmark paper by uh, Dembo, uh, Perez, uh, Rosen, and uh, Zaituni. And this was, um, 2001, I think in ACTA maybe. And uh, indeed they, they, they showed that, uh, uh, so they, they, they proved the full conjecture that uh, the, the size of the thick point is given at least, you know, when it comes to identifying the exponent uh, by uh, roughly n to the power two minus a. So this implies the Erdős-Taylor conjecture. Okay, so, so this was a major uh, breakthrough, um, as I said, and uh, today what I want to do is I want to discuss uh, uh, um, uh, what is in my mind uh, a remarkable and very substantial strengthening of this uh, result. Um, uh, so, And uh, so what we will see is that uh, this is stronger for two reasons, this result. One is that uh, uh, this sort of sub-polynomial uh, correction will be identified. So we ident so this identify exactly the, the, the dependence on N. And perhaps uh, even more remarkably, uh, gives us exactly the, the, the scaling limit, the, the, really the geometric picture. Uh, for, for, this, uh, for this set. And uh, so this is, um, this is what, what I hope to describe today. And this is a very recent development. Uh, so, um, let me fix some number a between zero and two. This is going to be the, the thickness parameter for the, for the local time. And uh, I'm going to uh, introduce a measure. So, let uh, mn of dz uh, denote uh, the following sum. So, this is the sum over all points, which are uh, thick, and I put a Dirac mass at this point, and then I normalize it appropriately. So I will multiply this by log n divided by the power n to the power of two minus a. So um, the, the, the theorem, let me call it theorem one, because uh, I will spend time to discuss it, uh, at least uh, some, part, some aspects of it today. So the theorem one, which uh, uh, is due to uh, Antoine Jego, uh, who uh, still for a few more months uh, will uh, remain a PhD student in uh, Vienna, but uh, will be moving to uh, EPFL uh, in Lausanne uh, in a few months time. So uh, the, the, the res his result is the following, that uh, uh, for each fixed value, of a between zero and two, a is strictly less than two. Uh, the random measures uh, mn converges converge uh, in distribution um, 
Okay, really, okay, let me, let me, let me write for the vague topology to uh, uh, limiting uh, measure. Uh, let's call it M. And this measure, let me also give it a name. Brownian multiplicative chaos. Uh, part of what I will do today is to tell you about this Brownian multiplicative chaos. Um, let me uh, say that, uh, uh, furthermore, um, yeah, so furthermore, uh, if I look at the, so the total number of thick points, then this gives you the, the, the correct way to normalize it to get something non-trivial in the limit. So this converge to a certain quantity, which is non-trivial. It's almost surely positive and almost surely finite. So yeah, so this is, as I said, uh, uh, it's a remarkable result in my opinion. Uh, it uh, gives the exact way you have to normalize uh, the, the set of thick points. It uh, so it goes significantly beyond the, the, the result of Dembo Perez, Rose, and Zaituni because uh, we get not only the, the polynomial behavior, the polynomial dependence on N, but even the sub polynomial terms and really the, the scaling limit uh, here, and also gives you a geometric picture uh, of what is happening to this, uh, to this set. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, since uh, uh, I have pictures, so I, I, th I thought what I will do is I will include a nice picture of him here. You can see him. Ah, no. <laughs> What's going on here? So, there we are. So, here's a picture of Antoine Jego uh, smiling. Probably uh, not long after he proved this theorem, I don't know. Um, so, uh, right. So, so I, I would like to discuss this uh, this theorem um, a little bit, and really, uh, so the, the the theorem is is uh, the consequence really of two papers. And uh, the, the, the first one is, uh, if you want, the, the definition of, and the, the construction of this uh, Brownian multiplicative chaos. And the, the second one itself is really about the, the, the convergence of a discrete approximation. And so I'll say a few words about uh, both aspects because I think both are uh, very interesting. Uh, but let me say that uh, right away uh, that there is an overall uh, um, maybe strategy, I don't know if strategy is uh, the right uh, name, but maybe philosophy, and uh, which sort of motivates a lot of the, the analysis uh, that goes uh, through these two papers. And the overall strategy, I think, is to uh, exploit uh, similarities uh, with uh, Gaussian multiplicative chaos. Uh, so maybe at this stage, uh, you might uh, wonder, okay, so uh, you have told us about Gaussian multiplicative chaos. You have mentioned that there is this link, but uh, I, I still don't know. Uh, I still don't know why it's possible, why there should be, why I should expect a link between uh, the two stories. And maybe uh, uh, if you're wondering about this, uh, the easiest way that I can convince you is uh, that there is uh, uh, a bunch of uh, results 
usually called isomorphism theorems. Uh, so let me uh, mention uh, here uh, Dinkin, uh, Eisenbaum, um, Lejean. So this is in the mathematical literature, but actually, uh, there's a foolish in Spencer sometime before that. Uh, uh, also uh, have something to, 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 to say about this. And these isomorphism theorems, they're sort of common themes. There are several versions of it, uh, but uh, uh, one sort of common thread is that um, there, there is a relation. So this is a relation between uh, local time. So let's write it LXN. Uh, the, the local time viewed as a field and uh, one half of uh, Gaussian free field uh, squared. So here maybe uh, you, you can think this is the, the discrete Gaussian free field, which, uh, ah, I was, I hesitated when I said that. Thank you, Tyler. And really given that this is hosted by uh, UBC, this seminar, really this mistake is unforgivable. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, thank you very much, Tyler, for pointing this out. I hesitated when I said it and I wasn't sure anymore. So there we are. So, so this connection is, is a, right, a relation, uh, really it's an exact relation, but between uh, different versions of the local time and different versions of the Gaussian free field. So let me just say it's, it's a, um, you, you can think of it as an approximation, if you like, between uh, the local time and one half of the, of the discrete Gaussian free field squared. And so um, if you're interested in, uh, uh, you know, local time having a thickness A, uh, right, so A times two over squared, <laughs> So, you know, A represents the, the, the thickness for the local time. It's a good idea to uh, uh, introduce a parameter gamma that's going to represent the thickness for the Gaussian free field. And uh, we're going to have a relation between A and gamma uh, where A is equal to one half of gamma squared. Okay, so this, this says, uh, if you like, that. Uh, uh, so local time being greater than a times this constant times log n squared, uh, this, this constant is, is often called G uh, because it relates to the normalization of the green function. And um, uh, so if I'm asking for the local time uh, to be greater than uh, a times G times log n squared, then this is essentially equivalent to one half of the Gaussian free field square being greater than uh, uh, well, a, um, a, which is uh, gamma squared over two, let me write it like that, times uh, g times uh, log n squared. And so this is the same thing as asking the Gaussian free field to be greater than gamma times the square root of g times uh, log n. Okay, and so, uh, we, we've talked, those of you who stayed in the discussion uh, after the, the talk yesterday know that there is this notion of thick points for the Gaussian free field that also play a big role in uh, Gaussian multiplicative chaos. The Gaussian multiplicative chaos measure is supported on, on, on thick points um, and uh, of the Gaussian free field, thick exactly in this sense. And uh, so this suggests indeed uh, that there is a connection uh, between uh, uh, Gaussian free field, between thick points of the random walk and uh, and multiplicative chaos. In fact, let me just uh, make a, a remark at this point that if you change the question and you you use this dictionary that I just wrote, uh, you, you you replace local thick points of the local time for the random walk by thick points of the Gaussian free field in this sense. Uh, the, the, the analog of this theorem uh, was proved not so long ago, actually, by uh, Biscuit and Widor. So, I actually don't know the year. Maybe somebody knows in the audience. 
so they proved that uh, if I look, if let's give it a name, I don't know, Sn of gamma is the, the set of points where uh, a discrete Gaussian free field would be greater than gamma times square root g times log n, then uh, the following measure, so I put a Dirac mass at every point that is stick for the Gaussian free field and I normalize it appropriately. Um, then this converge to uh, mu gamma, so this is Uville measure, so Right, so this is what we talked about yesterday. This is the limit as epsilon tends to zero of uh, epsilon to the gamma squared over two e to the gamma uh, h epsilon of x. Maybe let's call, let me call it x epsilon of x to be consistent with my notations from yesterday. Uh, dx. Okay, so this is basically. Uh, uh, Gaussian multiplicative chaos of the Gaussian free field. Okay, so formally it is a very similar uh, result um, where uh, the, 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 the difference to, to the theorem one of uh, Antoine Jego that I mentioned earlier is that the, the here we have uh, in the right hand side uh, as a limit Gaussian multiplicative chaos. Um, over there, in the earlier result, uh, th this limit M is what uh, I call Brownian multiplicative chaos, what he called Brownian multiplicative chaos. So I will tell you about it. It's related to Gaussian multiplicative chaos, but it's also different. Um, and there's also maybe uh, uh, those of you who uh, are paying attention will have noticed that the, the normalization uh, does not have quite the same uh, uh, sub-polynomial uh, terms. Okay, so for, for the local time of random walk, we had a log n here, whereas for the Gaussian free field, we have a square root log n. So uh, although the two things, the two results are very similar, there are in fact uh, subtle but clear uh, differences uh, between the two. So, uh, right, so are, are there questions uh, at this point? Uh, on, on, on this remark or uh, uh, the, 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 the theorem that I wanted to prove or that I want to discuss at least. So far so good. Right, so, um, Right, so the first thing that I want to do is I want to, to say a few words about the, the definition uh, of uh, Brownian multiplicative chaos. And here, um, uh, there's really uh, three papers to, 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 to connect to this story. Uh, the, fir the, first, uh, the first paper, uh, is one uh, that is uh, uh, already uh, dating from uh, 1994, and uh, this uh, defined uh, the, this Brownian multiplicative chaos. They didn't call it uh, like that in that paper, um, but it, it ended up being the same object uh, that the one uh, I, I will discuss, except uh, th this construction was valid for uh, a limited range of the values of the parameter zero uh, of, the, uh, of the parameter a. In fact, it was uh, uh, the, the range was uh, the interval zero half. Um, so in this story, it's frequent that the you know uh, stories related to the Gaussian multiplicative chaos. It's frequent that the L two phase is uh, much simpler to handle than the full L one phase. Uh, the L1 phase would be the interval 0, 2. Actually, the L2 phase uh, would end uh, at A equals 1. So here, this is a strict subset of the uh, L2 phase uh, of Gaussian multiplicative chaos. Uh, so in this analogy. Um, 
So then, so th this, this measure will construct, so as I said, for a limited range of the parameter A, a Bas by uh, Bas, Birdzi, and Koshnevisan in 1994. Uh, and then uh, there were two papers uh, simultaneously uh, in 2020. They were they, they, they both got published in 2020, so last year. Uh, one by uh, Jego in uh, 2020, and another one by uh, Aidecon, uh, who and uh, she also in 2020. Um, maybe I should say that uh, this uh, sort of the, the, the paper by Aide Konku and she is uh, extending the, the, the results of Bass and Birdy. So following the approach uh, that they uh, initiated, but of course going uh, into the full range of parameters. Uh, Jego had a different approach. Uh, I personally find it uh, more transparent. So that's the one I'm going to, to present. Uh, because I think it's uh, very nice and also really showcases uh, the analogy with uh, Gaussian multiplicative chaos. So uh, this is this is uh, the, the the result I'm going to discuss uh, now is uh, from from this paper, which it's a different paper than the one uh, uh, of theorem one. So again, uh, let D uh, in R two be uh, open and bounded. And um, if we take a point uh, X in D and uh, epsilon strictly positive, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, you know, earlier I had a random walk, but now I'm going to talk about Brownian motion. So uh, let uh, L X epsilon, so this is going to be the, the local time of Brownian motion. Uh, uh, on uh, the boundary of, well, on a circle of radius epsilon around X. Okay, so if I think about the, the maybe you might wonder what, what that is, this local time. So this is just like a local time of one dimensional Brownian motion. So if I think about the distance to the point X of Brownian motion, I know this is a Bessel process. Um, and so this Bessel process will have uh, a fixed you know, we'll have a certain local time at any fixed positive distance away from from uh, from X. Okay, so just because it's a one-dimensional uh, semi-martingale, I guess, and every semi-martingale has a well-defined local time. Uh, here, you need to work a little bit more. I, I will just say that uh, it can be shown. Uh, this is not obvious. Can be shown that there is. Uh, a, jointly continuous in X and epsilon modification. Okay, so my uh, Brownian multiplicative chaos is going to be uh, defined uh, really in this way. So now, you know, I have uh, maybe a starting point. I didn't say I have a starting point, let's call it X zero. I have a point X somewhere in the domain, a small ball of radius uh, epsilon, and I have my brown motion. It goes uh, maybe uh, it visits uh, close to X, and I count the total local time spent by this brown motion on the circle of radius epsilon around X. That's that's what I call LX epsilon. So um, the the so I will define with this. Uh, with this local time, I will define a measure, an approximate measure. So, okay, so fix uh, gamma between zero and two. Now I'm going to switch to notations that are connected to Gaussian multiplicative chaos. So gamma is the same parameter as yesterday. Um, and uh, so uh, define a measure. So random measure. M epsilon of dx. Uh, so this is how it's defined. So um, epsilon to the gamma squared over two. So this is uh, similar to normalization that you have in Gaussian multiplicative chaos. And then uh, what I want to do is I want to uh, exponentiate, not the local time, I want to exponentiate the square root of the local time. 
and really I have to normalize it uh, uh, so, so, so that I take the average of the local time basically at distance epsilon. Okay, so uh, why uh, the square root here? It's again because of this isomorphism. Uh, this, this isomorphism is telling us that local time is approximately the Gaussian free field square. So if I take the square root of the local time, I have effectively uh, a log correlated, uh, I have effectively a log correlated field. Okay, so, so this is why it's reasonable to take a square root in the exponential. But actually, if I do that, uh, I don't have the right object. So this is what you would do if uh, you know there was a strict dictionary between Gaussian multiplicative chaos and local time of Brownian motion. It's not quite so simple. So you have to normalize things a bit more subtly than you do in a Gaussian multiplicative chaos. And so you have to add this extra factor of square root uh, log one over epsilon. Okay, and so this is new compared to GMC. So the, the theorem uh, that he proved in this, so let me call it theorem two, uh, is um, really that this, this measure converge. So, uh, so this is the, uh, in this formulation, this is due to, 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 to Antoine Jago in 2020, the, the paper has appeared in Annals of Probability. Um, as I said, the same measure was uh, constructed using a different uh, approach, first by Bas, Burzi, and Kosnevisan for A less than half, and also by uh, Aidekon, Hu, and Xi for the full range of uh, values of uh, the parameter A or parameter gamma, if you like, uh, but using a different approximation, different approach. And the, 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 the theorem here says that the, these measures uh, converge in probability Toward uh, a limiting measure uh, call it a. Okay, and so this is what we want to call Brownian multiplicative chaos. So um, I have a few simulations for you. These are simulations that uh, Antoine uh, obtained. Um, so let me try to get this in the order. Uh, one thing that's very nice compared to the simulations we had yesterday is that we had the good taste of writing down the values of gamma above the simulation. So there is no chance that I will get confused this time. So here are four simulations, both uh, all, all four were obtained by uh, Antoine. Uh, so here this is done with a single uh, realization of a random walk trajectory. It, uh, it is living in a square uh, where the, the mesh size n is, uh, I think, 400, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, with this single realization uh, of random walk, you see uh, various realizations of the uh, Brownian multiplicative chaos associated to different uh, values of the parameter gamma. So. Um, uh, you, you can see in blue at the bottom here, uh, the, the trajectory of the walk itself, and above it sits uh, uh, an approximate density, if you like, uh, of this measure. And so you see exactly the same phenomenon as what we discussed yesterday. As gamma increase, uh, we see uh, uh, the, the measure being supported on fewer and fewer points. Uh, uh, and uh, peaks becoming more uh, pronounced, uh, so to speak. And uh, up until the, the point where we're very close to gamma equals to two, the critical value, like in Gaussian multiplicative chaos. And then the, 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 the measure kind of almost stops to exist, really. It just barely exists on a few points. And uh, uh, that, is, uh, that is what's happening. Okay, so I should say that, uh, you know, it's a, the, the phenomenology is very similar to uh, what we had yesterday uh, in Gaussian multiplicative chaos, uh, but really there are also uh, very serious differences. So for instance, one of those is that this is really entirely supported by the trajectory of a Brownian motion. Okay, so uh, it does not exist outside the support of Brownian motion, this, this measure. And in fact, it is generated by the trajectory of Brownian motion. So there's no uh, extra Gaussian field that I'm using to exponentiate 
for those of you who know Liouville Brown emotion, you might uh, be re reminded of Liouville Brown emotion, but, but this is a very different beast uh, in a sense. Okay, so these are simulations uh, of this brand new multiplicative chaos. Are there questions uh, on this? So maybe I should say as a remark, um, uh, there is, uh, maybe it's useful to comment on this. There's a, a, a paper by uh, Abbe and Biscup uh, where, uh, essentially, a, a similar problem is studied, uh, but the, the random walk um, is uh, run on a, on a box where uh, the, the boundary of the box has been wired. So every time the, the walk touches the boundary, it sort of re-emerges, if you like, uh, somewhere else that has been selected uh, uniformly on the, on the boundary of the box and uh, continue uh, walking. Is, so it's run on a box uh, with wired boundary and uh, up to a time um, that is, let's say proportional to the, to the cover time of the box. And uh, so, uh, you know, and then if you look at uh, essentially a measure on thick points associated with the local time of this walk, uh, they, they obtained um, convergence to Uville measure. Yeah, so I should say uh, what is happening. So uh, this kind of looks a bit similar perhaps to the, the results uh, I just mentioned. Uh, in my opinion, there are very substantial differences between the, the, the two things. So if, if you like what is happening in the paper of Abbe and Biscups, the, the, the walk is run for a very long time. And the, the more you run the walk for a long time, and the more, if you like, the approximation that you get from uh, the isomorphisms becomes uh, close to the reality. And so when the walk is run for a long time, like close to the cover time of the box, in fact, the approximation is very good. And this is why when you exponentiate the square root of the local time, if you like, uh, you get convergence to uh, UV measure. Maybe this is uh, not too surprising. Um, I think what is uh, really remarkable uh, in the results that uh, Antoine proved is really that uh, uh, this, this, this conversion takes place much before the cover time in particular, uh, at a time when, when the, 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 the trajectory of the walk does not even cover uh, a positive proportion of the, of the box, right? So the, the, the fraction of sites visited is, is tending to zero. Okay, so, um, right. So maybe let me, I don't know if I give it a name. Yes, I call it theorem two. Uh, I wanted to say something about theorem one and theorem two. So, uh, So these, these two theorems, um, they maybe uh, uh, they, they, they maybe appear or they sound similar. So you, you could take the view that uh, uh, both of them are about convergence of some approximation uh, of Brownian motion and, and the thick points of this approximation uh, for the local time of Brownian motion. So in one case, we used uh, uh, discrete approximation uh, where we approximate random motion by random walk and we compute to the local time at a point that is well defined. Uh, in the other case, we started from Brownian motion, but of course you can't speak of local time at the point. So you, 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 you look at the local time uh, uh, close to a given point. So that's the, the circle, uh, the circle approximation to uh, this, this local time. And uh, in both cases, you try to, to prove that uh, uh, a measure associated with these uh, thick points, they are converging to, to the same object. So in some sense, you could take the view that theorem one and two, well, you know, there are different approximations, but, but you get the same object because it's a manifestation of universality. Um, but so this is in a sense, right? Um, 
but let me make uh, uh, some some important comments. Uh, the first one is that uh, in in theorem two, the one that I presented about wrong emotion, there is no universality. Yeah, so here in the statements of that theorem, I, I you know I, I used circle averages for the local time. This is maybe a bit different from the situation in Gaussian multiplicative chaos that I presented yesterday, uh, because there we, we took uh, some modification of the Gaussian free field and we obtained the convergence to a limit. And the limit is the same no matter how you regularize the Gaussian free field. So here in the statement that I presented, there is no statement of universality with respect to the uh, normal to the re regularization, even if this regularization is continuous. So this is the first difference. There's no universality statement in this uh, theorem too. And maybe, uh, and this is related to some extent, but uh, uh, it's a much more significant obstruction. Uh, the, the method of proof uh, for theorem two, which is inspired by uh, ideas from Gaussian multiplicative chaos, uh, can absolutely not be adapted to uh, theorem one. And uh, the, the reason uh, is uh, maybe easy to, to understand. It, it can sound a bit technical, but it really is a totally fundamental obstruction. Uh, and if you remember a bit uh, what I did yesterday in uh, Gaussian multiplicative chaos, uh, what I did was I, I proved that the total mass uh, uh, of this chaos, uh, as you change the, the scale of regularization epsilon, it gives you a Cauchy sequence in L2, in L2 of the probability space. And what that means is that you have to compare uh, the, the Gaussian multiplicative chaos with two different scales of regularization and show that the difference in L2 is a very small uh, random variable. So it's to, to implement this approach, it's totally crucial that you have a fixed object and you're able to compare two different scales of regularization. Right? That, that's totally fundamental to the approach. If, if you can't do that, then this breaks. And if you think about it, uh, this is exactly what happens when you're talking about uh, discrete approximation to brown motion. So if you have random walk, of course, random walk with a fine lattice mesh size converges to brown motion, but it's very, very hard uh, to compare in a way that is natural uh, uh, a random walk with a mesh size one over n and another random walk with a mesh size one over n. It's just very hard to do. Uh, there are ways to do that, but there, no, none of those ways are particularly natural, basically. Uh, so in particular, uh, this was in fact a difficulty that was uh, already present in the work of uh, Dembo Perez, uh, Rosen Zetouni. So uh, they obtained uh, their results on the dimension of the three points of random walk by first doing calculations for Brownian motion. And then they used, uh, you know, this strong approximation, these strong couplings, KMT, approximation of random walk by uh, Brownian motion uh, to transfer the results for Brownian motion uh, to results on random walk. And this is something that you can do so long as you're not looking for information that's not that's too precise. So basically, if you're interested in, in the dimension of thick points, you can do that. This is the, the KMT approximation is good enough for you to do that. But at the level that we're talking about, where we're really discussing very fine properties of the steep points, uh, such approximations are uh, not, not useful, at least uh, not that I know of. And so, um, uh, so, so really you have to, to come up with uh, uh, a, a new point of view. So just to kind of uh, uh, summarize what I just, what I just said, uh, the, the theorem too, which is about the construction of this Brownian multiplicative chaos, you can use ideas that are similar to Gaussian multiplicative chaos because there's a fixed Brownian motion and you can compare different scales of regularization of this Brownian motion. So that makes sense. You can try to adapt this uh, 
uh, uh, proof uh, that I that I sort of partly outlined yesterday. And uh, of course, there's a lot of technicalities when you do that, but still at the at the heart, this is uh, this is what what it comes from. When you're trying to uh, deal with discrete approximations to uh, Brown motion, starting from random walk, then it's a, it's a totally different story. So uh, I wanted to say, I don't have much time, but I wanted to say uh, a, a word about this uh, in maybe the last couple of minutes for today's lecture. And um, uh, so the idea for uh, theorem one is to, once you have constructed this continuous object, uh, you have done some work that is useful. So the idea is to, uh, uh, is to uh, provide uh, an axi axiomatic characterization of this, um, of uh, Brownian multiplicative chaos. And uh, for this, uh, I should say that uh, there is an idea that uh, I, I think is very clever in that paper. And uh, and uh, the, the idea is to not just consider the, the chaos generated by a single Brownian trajectory, but rather uh, to consider uh, traject, you know, the, 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 the chaos generated by the interaction between multiple trajectories. So if you sort of enlarge the set of objects that you're looking at, so you allow, you, you're considering not just a single trajectory, Brownian trajectory and the chaos that it generates, but in fact, uh, you allow yourself to consider multiple trajectories, multiple independent trajectories, and you can see how they, their combined local time gives you thick points. Then uh, it turns out uh, proving a characterization uh, of these objects become uh, much, uh, much more doable, much more uh, 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 simple to phrase and to, 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 to prove. So it, it, a crucial idea is to enlarge the set of things that you're looking at by considering not just uh, single trajectories, but the interaction between uh, multiple trajectories. Um, and I wanted to uh, mention in, in maybe in 30 seconds that that's left. So. So this is, I think, a, a nice byproduct of his uh, analysis uh, that uh, I personally like very much. So suppose I have a, a blue trajectory, which is a brown motion, and an, an independent trajectory, a red trajectory that goes like that. And the question is, suppose I take a point which is thick for the combined local time of both of these trajectories. So the question is, to what extent did each trajectory contribute to the thickness? Is it, uh, you know, does all the thickness come from either the blue or, all the, or, either, or, or the red trajectory completely? Or is it the case that maybe half and half of the thickness come from the blue and from the red? Or is it a more spread out uh, um, uh, contribution? And the, so he, he, he's able to give, first of all, to give a meaning to this question. It's not obvious that you can really give a precise meaning to this question, uh, but he is able to do that in his paper. And uh, I think one, one thing that is very nice in, in his paper is that um, uh, you, you, you can, if you have a point of thickness A, then the respective, for the combined local time, then the respective contribution of each trajectory is in fact exactly uniform on zero A. Okay, so this is, so each trajectory is going to be thick at this point and how thick it's going to be a uniform random variable on zero A. And uh, of course the, the, the other trajectory takes the complement, takes uh, A minus this uh, uh, uniform random variable, which is also uniform uh, on zero A. Okay, so this is, I think a, a very nice uh, uh, byproduct of this analysis. I think it's, uh, Sort of something we can we can think about. Let me mention, by the way, that the, the uh, analogous property for Gaussian free field is just wrong. So this is just to give you an idea that uh, things are subtle. So if I take uh, if I consider the sum of two Gaussian free fields and I take a point that is thick for the sum, it is not true that both of them are going to contribute in a way that is uniform. Uh, so 
uh, it, it sort of gives you an idea that there are some uh, interesting things uh, happening uh, for this interaction of uh, brain emotion. Uh, tomorrow, we will talk about an extension of this theory to uh, Brownian loop soup, uh, and we will see how this uh, gets us back to uh, the Gaston free field in a way that is uh, interesting and unexpected and, and, and allows us to connect uh, several objects to the, together in a way that I, I think is quite neat. And uh, these sort of magical properties of interaction of brown emotion uh, become quite important. So I'll stop here for today and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Nathanel. So let's all maybe unmute ourselves and thank Nathanel for the wonderful lecture.